Good evening and a warm welcome to the Oxford University Scientific Society in week two of Hillary term. We're glad to have all of you here today for Professor Marcos Dussorto's talk on his newest book, The Creativity Code. Professor Dussorto is an old friend of the OUSS. He is also the Charles Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science here at Oxford, as well as a fellow of New College. Before we begin, our speaker would like me to remind you that there will be interactive elements in his talk. You should be able to participate as long as you have a laptop or mobile phone ready. Further instructions will be explained in the talk. As per usual, please write your questions in the comments section along the way. Without further ado, Professor Dussortoy, the stage is yours. Great. Well, it's uh, so uh, great to be with you all. If if virtually, it's a very strange time. Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk about artificial intelligence and creativity. Uh, the talk is called uh, The Creativity Code. Um, so I suppose I, if I was really clever, I would have made uh, a little avatar that would be giving my talk and I'd be in enjoying myself watching some, binging on some box sets um, next door. Um, but no, it's, it's really a human giving this talk, um, but I am going to try and use a little bit of technology during this talk to get a little bit of interaction with you because one of the deep frustrations about doing talks uh, via all these strange uh, platforms is that it's, uh, I, I miss out on interacting with you all. So I'm hopefully you're seeing my screen at the moment and it's got uh, a website address. It's called glisser.live forward slash creativity code. So you're probably watching this on some device already, but if perhaps you've got another device or another window, um, enter this website into a, uh, into a browser and it will pull up my slides so you can be able to see the slides. But at various points during the talk, I'm going to offer you a few kind of uh, art touring tests to see whether you can spot the difference between art created by a human and art created by some AI and we'll have a look at the data and see what how good you are at uh, sniffing out um, the AI from the, the human. Um, so, um, at the end of the talk, you'll also be able to download the slides that I'm going to uh, show you as well. So um, hopefully that will all work. And so the um, uh, website address is up in the corner as well of the uh, presentation as we go along. So um, we've had a really exciting sort of few years, I think, when it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, because there's been a kind of real explosion for decades we've been talking about kind of AI winters where everyone's been expecting so much and nothing's really happened. Now I say we were really in a, an AI heat wave at the moment where things have really accelerated fast and so much so that most newspaper articles are all about how uh, we as humans are going to be uh, um, superseded, the singularity, we're going to get put out of a job, um, you know, AI will be our, our doctors, our lawyers, our drivers. Um, Will there be anything left for us humans to do? Um, uh, and I think there is one thing that we feel is uniquely human, and and that's our ability to be creative. And I think you know it's, it's funny because um, a lot of people think that uh, I'm a professor of mathematics um, here at Oxford University, and I think a lot of people feel like, well, oh, surely mathematics isn't that something that ai would be able to do very easily because ai artificial intelligence after all is just very clever code and code is just very good algorithms and algorithms are basically the ingredients of mathematics so isn't it already doing mathematics so why couldn't it be proving theorems like all my colleagues are in the maths institute in oxford um and uh i think actually a lot of people in the 90s really thought we must be out of a job when you know a computer was able to play the game of chess at a really high level deep blue beating gary kaspar off at this game and chess had always been held up as something a little bit like doing mathematics um uh but i always said at the time and i still say that no hold on it isn't just about running code turning a handle Doing mathematics is highly creative. It requires kind of leaps into the unknown, uh, a lot of intuition. Um, it, it's something that is actually very human, I feel. Um, and, and so I always use this word creativity as a kind of protective tool, uh, shield against 
why I thought AI can't do my job of being a mathematician. And actually, there was always another game, not chess, which I feel is, uh, uh, you know, it has some similarities with mathematics because there are logical moves you can make. There is an end game. The checkmate is a bit like a QED. Uh, but I felt there was another game that was much closer to what it feels like to be a mathematician. And some of you may know this game, may play this game. Um, it's the ancient Chinese game of Go. Uh, this is a game played on a 19 by 19 grid and you put black and white stones down. And, and essentially the aim of the game is that you want to try and surround more of your opponent's stones than they have surrounded of yours. Um, and this is a game that, uh, actually requires a lot of kind of pattern recognition to play. It's very hard to articulate kind of the the way somebody plays. And, and very often when you ask a Go player, why did you make that move? They'll say, oh, it just felt right. Um, and, and there's a, a lot of looking at the patterns as they build up on the board and, and having a feel for the, for the patterns that are emerging to help you make your decision about your next move. Um, and actually, I've always called mathematics uh, um, the science of patterns. I mean, that's what I am, a pattern searcher. So I think there's quite a lot of similarity between the patterns that I'm looking for in my own subject and the patterns emerging in this game. And traditionally, this game was uh, a game that was thought to be very difficult to write code to play, um, partly because Go players really found it very difficult to articulate why they were making moves. So traditionally, code was written in a very top-down manner. If this, then do that. If that, then do this. And uh, if you couldn't really explain why you were making moves, what the, the conditions on the board were that meant you made that move, very hard to write code for. Um, and so uh, traditionally, this is a game that computers found very, very difficult to play. Um, and I think it's the kind of intuition, creativity of the game that made it so difficult. Um, uh, but I realized things had really changed when um, a few years ago, uh, a company uh, called DeepMind, many of you have heard of DeepMind, um, said that they managed to develop some code, which they called AlphaGo, that they believed could compete at an incredibly high level. And they challenged uh, the best humans have at this game, uh, Lee Sedol, a Korean player. Um, Lee Sedol had played computers in the past and they never got anywhere near an even an amateur level. So he was totally dismissive of the ability of this code to play this game. And um, so he, he said, oh, I'm going to be able to trounce it 5-0. He was almost felt insulted that they had to play this match. Um, however, at the end of this match, five games they played, um, he'd lost 4-1. And that one game he did win, he now regards as the most valuable win of his um, whole career. Um, so what exactly had changed? Why were we able to make code um, that could play this game at such a, a high level? Well, code is being written in a very different way in the last few years. And many of you probably heard of this thing called machine learning, deep learning. Uh, and this is where code um, is allowed to change and mutate to to uh, update itself, reparameterize itself um, according to its interactions with data. So in this case, um, it would perhaps uh, look at a human game. So it took all the human games that we have online and it, it began to, uh, uh, to learn and change uh, in its strategies uh, through the learning process of seeing how uh, one side won the game and one lost it. Um, and then when it ran out of human games, it started making synthetic games, It synthetic data. It, it played itself and different versions could then find that they had sort of more optimal ways of playing. And the extraordinary thing is that this learning process actually uh, converged on uh, a piece of code that was able to play at an incredibly high level. Um, and um, I suppose we got quite used to computers doing things better than humans. So maybe not such a big surprise. But for me, the big surprise is, uh, is not that this piece of code was able to play so well. It was the way it played and in particular something that happened in the second game um, of the of the match. And uh, this is uh, the position. The 36th move was made by Lee Sedol. He's playing white. Um, he was already pretty exhausted by this stage, um, went up to the top of the hotel in Seoul to smoke a cigarette. We humans still need uh, nicotine to stimulate our creative uh, juices. Um, AlphaGo sat there for a while and then asked the human player to play a Blackstone on 
on the fifth row in from the edge, I put a little white circle on the, the, the black stone. Um, now, I was watching these games obsessively on YouTube because I realized if code can play this game, maybe code can do mathematics. Um, and I remember the incredible gasp that the commentators made when this stone went down, because this traditionally early on in the game uh, is regarded as a very weak move. Um, early on in the game, Go players are taught to compete on the first four rows in from the edge. There's kind of competition for the very edge of the board and the the sort of uh, beginning to creep into the center. But a, a stone this early on, on the fifth row in from the edge, is regarded as very weak. If your go master had seen you do that, he would have slapped your wrists and said, think again. Um, so uh, the commentators said, wow, well, Lisa Doll should be able to even up the game. He'd lost the first game, should be able to win from this point on. Lisa Doll comes down, sees this stone and the double take he does, he can't understand why AlphaGo suggested such a bad move. He's already got quite a bit of respect for this code, given the way it played in the first game. And he thinks for a while and he just can't see what on earth's, uh, the, what on earth's going on with this move. So play goes on and towards the end of the game, uh, competition uh, starts to happen for the uh, area building from the bottom right-hand corner of this board. And it turns out that the, the person, the player who controls this whole area and wins the game is the one who's placed that black stone down on move 37. Um, and AlphaGo wins this game uh, thanks to that very early, what was regarded as very weak move, but turns out to be a very powerful move. And for me, this was a real phase change moment in artificial intelligence. I would say this is the first time I've seen artificial intelligence genuinely being creative. Uh, and so how, what do I mean by creative? I, I quite like this definition um, that I took from Margaret Bowden, who's a cognitive scientist. Uh, and, and she has this nice definition of creativity. She's been thinking about creativity and machines for some time. She says you should regard something as creative if it's new. Well, computers can make thing, new things quite easily. Uh, we can judge that quite objectively if it's new or not, whether we've seen it before. Um, but the other two elements are more interesting, surprise and value. So these are much more subjective. Um, surprise for one person won't be for another. Surprise is about your emotional reaction to something. Value, well, how do we value something? That changes across time, across geography, across history. Um, uh, but I think in this case, we can really see these three things uh, uh, happening in this game. This move 37, it was a new sort of move. It surprised the, the commentators. Um, they thought it was a bad move. And ultimately, you can judge value in a game because does it win or lose you the game? So I think that we should regard this as um, a creative move made by the code. And I say made by the code because you could say, well, hold on. It's just it's really the creativity of the human who programmed uh, this uh, piece of code. But, but no, I think that because the code is allowed to change and mutate using this thing, machine learning, deep learning, it's changing such that actually, ultimately, um, at the end, the code is so complex that um, the humans who started the code don't really know how it's making its decisions. And frankly, if a human had seen that line of code play on the fifth row in from the edge early on in the game, they would have deleted that line of code saying, oh, that's a bad move. It's 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 learn it's bad learning there. So that line of code genuinely came out of the learning process of, of, of the code itself. So I really think one can think about calling this the creativity of, of, of the code and not the human. And for me, the exciting thing about this and about the impact that um, this new sort of code is having uh, on us as humans is that we as humans often think we've reached the um, the peak of how to do something. In, in the case of the game of Go, our Lisa Doll felt that he was playing at the peak of how humans can play this game. What the code has revealed to us is that although that was quite a superior way of playing, there's an even better way to play the game. And it's taught us humans how to play this game in a new way. So um, often we think we're at the peak but that turns out in mathematics, we call this a local maximum. It's not actually the uh, the global maximum. There's actually a, a, another place which is even higher. So the, the, the AI has sort of cleared a fog around the way we are doing things and revealed new ways of doing them. So I think this is the really exciting 
potential of this collaboration between uh, human and AI, that AI can help to push us off our current ways of thinking and show us perhaps um, better ways that we can play a game like the game of Go. Um, this moment uh, when I watched this match set me off on a journey um, which culminated uh, uh, a couple uh, last year in the publication of a book called The Creativity Code, where I thought, well, look, if it can be creative in the uh, simple scenario of a game, where else could it be creative? Could it be creative um, in areas that we regard as uniquely human, painting, writing, poetry, um, uh, music, um, or even doing mathematics. Um, so in this new book, I've kind of gone on a journey seeing both whether my own subject of mathematics, how good is AI at coming up with new mathematics, but also the creative arts. Um, and it's interesting, actually, one of the first people that uh, thought about writing code, and we celebrate as the first computer uh, coder is Ada Lovelace. Uh, she was taken by her mother to see this wonderful machine made by Charles Babbage to speed up mathematical calculations, multiplication, long division. And when she saw this machine, she began to think, well, actually, I think this machine can do some more interesting things. And she started to write down instructions to get the code, the machine to do uh, perhaps more complex uh, thought process um, than just you know, uh, multiplication. Um, and those notes that she wrote down, we now celebrate as the first example of com computer code. And in those um, notes, she's already speculating that the mach these machines might be able to do more interesting things than even just scientific things. Uh, she wrote, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. And I think it's interesting she chose music because you know, I, I I think a lot about the connections between mathematics and music. And so, um, you know, music, if maths is the science of patterns, maybe you can call music the art of patterns. Um, so um, I, I think that because there are patterns there that are being evolved, developed, changed connections, um, uh, quite a good idea to think of a machine and code perhaps making music. Um, but Lovelace had a word of caution about the role of the machine in this creative process. And she wrote, it's desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as the powers of the analytic engine. It has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we order it to perform. So she's still seeing that it's the human ultimately who's the cause of this creativity and the machine is just implementing the ideas um, of of, uh, of the human. Uh, and I think she was right when we're thinking about code in this very top down manner where a human writes code, the machine just implements it, may be able to do it faster, deeper. But the creativity is really the creativity of the human. But I think things have changed. And I think that moment in the game of Go is a, an indication that this may not be the case anymore. You probably all heard of the Turing test. I'm going to give you some challenges, which are a bit like Turing tests. But there's now a new test called the Lovelace test. Um, and this is a test of whether can a machine originate a creative work of art such that the process is repeatable. So this is an interesting condition in the test because um, what we don't want is that there's some external thing which is somehow causing the um, the choices being made. So it shouldn't be randomness or the, 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 what the weather is at the moment. It should really be integral to the code itself such that the code doesn't can repeat what it just did. It's not, it doesn't also know, not know why it's done something. Um, but here's the challenge that the code has become so complex that the programmer can't explain how the algorithm actually came up with its output. So I would say that already the Lovelace test has been passed if you call that move playing a game, um, a creative work. But what about creative works of art? You know, can we see examples uh, of things passing the Lovelace test in, in things we regard as much more human? Um, well, the book I looked at various different art forms, uh, the written word, music, but I actually started with a visual world. Uh, and I think the visual world is where AI uh, has been incredibly successful. In the past, vision was something that computers are very bad at. If you gave them an image, it, it because it was looking at the thing sort of pixel by pixel, it couldn't see an overarching story inside this image. But machine learning has really developed code that is very good now, having been given lots of images and told what they are. Given a new image, it seems to be very good at identifying 
that this is a cat and this is a dog um, and, and much richer as well. So I'm going to start with the visual world because I think that actually is where um, AI has also been quite successful, not just in identifying images, but actually creating its own. Uh, and I'm going to start, so I'm going to send you our first challenge. Um, so you should have got on your mobile devices or whatever you're looking at on your uh, on a computer window if you're following along with um, this presentation on, on this website, glsr.live forward slash creativity code. So um, this is going to give you a chance to vote on which one of these portraits do you think um, is created by a piece of code. It's the AI portrait. Um, so what you need to do is you need to just tap on the image that you think um, is not human, created by a human, send that to me. And then in a little bit, I'll reveal the data and see what you're thinking out there. Um, now, you're probably already able to identify perhaps who the human is. One of these is done by a human. Um, uh, you could probably guess that this is Rembrandt. Um, and the reason you can guess it's Rembrandt is partly why AI has a chance of, of actually replicating a Rembrandt, because Rembrandt has a very specific style, use of light, the way a portrait sits, um, the texture of the paint. And the AI was uh, given uh, many portraits. You also need quite a lot of portraits, and Rembrandt did a lot, over 300. And so there was a lot to learn on, um, and then was able to to, from that style, reproduce something of a similar nature. Um, and it's not just an averaging process. Actually, averaging generally doesn't give you something close to the original. Um, there was a very nice experiment that uh, Francis Galton did uh, where he was trying to uh, uh, see what the average criminal looks like. And he had lots of photographs of criminals, um, and they all sort of quite disfigured faces, tough lives and things like that. And he decided he'd average them all out. So he layered all of the negatives on top of each other. And the image that came out was incredibly beautiful because it had actually lots of artificial symmetry put on it. Um, so averaging isn't good enough. You've got to get something much more complex. Um, so let's see how well um, the AI is doing a, a falling you lot um, out there. Um, so hopefully we've got some data. So here we go. It's about... Uh, uh, three quarters to a quarter split here. So um, majority of you going for that portrait on the left, um, but some of you going, quarter of you going for the portrait on the right. Um, so let me show you those images again. So the portrait on the left, that's interesting that most of you feel that one is the AI one. It's certainly a little bit more photographic in nature, isn't it? I mean, um, it's kind of a slightly cleaner image, um, but you might think that maybe the AI wouldn't be good at that, but maybe a bit, bit fuzzy in its nature. Or, or, or but it seems to be that you're going for that one. Um, so uh, let's see whether you're changing. No, you still pretty stuck on that. So let me reveal. Are oh, you right? Yes, very good. You're all very good art critics out there, obviously. Um, actually, in some ways. I had to choose a portrait that uh, by Rembrandt, the one on the right is by Rembrandt. I had to choose a Rembrandt that you probably hadn't seen before. Um, uh, and so actually, I think it's not a particularly great Rembrandt. Um, so that might have thrown or you off the scent a little bit as well. Um, um, so you might say, well, you know, what, what's the point of this? Uh, and uh, quite a few people were kind of angry that we have wonderful Rembrandts. Why do we need pastiche making more Rembrandts? Um, uh, this is what Jonathan Jones thought about this. He's the art critic in The Guardian, and um, he hates anything to do with AI and art. And he wrote, what a horrible, tasteless, insensitive, and soulless travesty of all that is creative in human nature when technology is used for things it never should be used for. Um, but frankly, um, anyone who wears a shirt like that, I don't particularly trust as an art critic, actually. But um, but I think he has got a point. You know, there, there really isn't, you know, if we want AI to be creative, it isn't good enough just to be making more of the same. That's not being creative. Uh, that's sort of copying or pastiche. Um, but I think there is a point because, first of all, um, you know, every artist learns from the art of the past. So that's where an AI has got to start as well. So being able to, you know, Picasso did incredible uh, sort of uh, copies of style to be able to then make his own move into a new style. And secondly, there's actually the possibility of AI seeing things in the data that we might have missed. Um, and this is certainly the case, things like Jackson Pollock, for example, uh, those drip paintings that Pollock did, you might think, well, this should be very easy to make. But 
um, an algorithmic analysis of the geometry in those paintings reveals that actually he's creating uh, a sort of fractal geometry, which is actually quite hard to um, to fake. Um, and, and so that uh, using machine learning might give us new insights into old data. Um, but for me, I think the exciting thing is to go into the new. So um, here are some new paintings. Um, and I'm going to send these to your devices. So again, you get a chance to vote. Four of these paintings are by AI. Four of these paintings by human. So I want you, again, to click on the paintings that you think are artificial, that are not created by a human. Um, and, and these, I think, are a little bit more I I exciting because um, these are actually shown in Basel Art Fair um, uh, a couple of years ago. And they were put up in a gallery and uh, people entering the gallery weren't told there was any AI involved at all. And they were asked for their reaction to the different paintings, the human ones, the AI ones. And it was very striking that the AI paintings actually uh, elicited a more emotional reaction from the, the people visiting the gallery than the human ones. Um, and when they were told, oh, actually these are done by AI, um, many people felt very cheated by that. Um, and it's an interesting reaction because, and it, I think it goes to the heart of why we make art because we, we actually are using art as a way of communicating between human beings. Um, I want to communicate the way I see the world or I want to examine how I feel and share that with you. Um, and if you suddenly find there's no no consciousness behind these AI, um, you feel a bit cheated. But I think you have to remember the, the AI actually learnt on all of our paintings in order to make these. So, so it's learnt on our emotional world. So it's not surprising it's producing something that might cause us to have an emotional reaction. Um, so let's see how well you uh, are good at, how good are you at picking out these ones? Um, so let's reveal the split here. Okay, so you've gone the other way now. So um, about three quarters of you going for the paintings on the right being AI. Um, maybe you think being a mathematician of symmetry that um, if I put them on the left, then he's probably gonna put them on the right this time. Um, so are you right? Yes, yes you are. And it's interesting because let's, going back to these images, I think there's, if you've started to see some images created by AI, you're probably already starting to pick up a particular style that AI has when it's creating images. And it has this love of kind of complexity and detail and, and a kind of um, indeterminacy as well, which you're seeing in some of these images. Um, so I think there's almost a um, an AI style that's emerging that uh, is enabling people to pick out these. Um, but I think the other interesting thing is how these were made, because these are made using a very interesting new sort of algorithm called a generative adversarial network or a GAN. And these are two algorithms working almost like a game against each other. So, so one algorithm takes all of the art of the last 1,500 years and is uh, learns about style. So it's told this is a, a cubist painting, this is a pointillist painting, and it picks up the distinctive nature of that style. And then it's tasked with creating something that breaks that style. So this, the algorithm has got to do something new. It's got to not fit into a category that it's seen before, but it's still got to be close enough to art that we won't think, well, what's that? It's just a mess. So it's got to get this kind of sweet spot between something new that breaks style, but something not so new that we don't recognize it as art. And so it's the second algorithm, the discriminator algorithm, that judges how far it's gone either way. Either it says, no, I recognize that. You're still within the style of cubist art or something. Um, or, no, you've gone too far. This is this is too far from the parameter space of what we regard as art. And the two in tandem actually converged on these paintings, which... Um, uh, you know, actually did pass a pretty good Turing test. And after all, about a third of you, I think um, uh, by the end, a third of you thought that uh, they were the human ones. So, so it's doing pretty well. But I also think this captures very much how the creative mind works. Here's Paul Clay writing about the process of his painting. He says, already at the very beginning of the productive act, shortly after the initial motion to create, occurs the first counter motion, the initial movement of receptivity. This means the creator controls whether what he has produced so far is good. And I think that a lot of creative people talk about this sort of um, 
almost competition like that GAN in the mind, where something's bubbling away, trying things out, but you need to counter that with a, a judgment of like, no, this is this is not good enough. This isn't going well. Throw that away. It's not working. Um, and Paul Valéry, a poet, French poet, said it takes two to invent anything. The one makes up combinations and the other one chooses. And I think actually my own creative process as a mathematician, I do a lot of collaborating with uh, people around the world and we sort of form this sort of good cop, bad cop kind of uh, approach to our mathematics where for example, a colleague in Germany, um, I'm the sort of bubbly creator one, and he's the discriminator saying, no, that doesn't work, oh, this works. And then I have another collaborator in Israel uh, where we almost swap the roles. So he's the bubbly creative one, and I'm the one judging saying, no, this isn't working because of this. Um, so I, I like the way this algorithm, this GAN, is capturing something about how we are, how we operate as, as creative humans. Um, but as you have the visual world, I, I think this story was the one that I thought was most interesting. So this is um, a project called Deep Dream by Google. Their vision recognition software is um, is really excellent. Uh, it, you give it an image, it's very hard to fool it. But they were intrigued to uh, ask the question, well, OK, it's good at identifying images. What is it actually seeing? Um, and so they decided to kind of reverse the process, give it a, a rather amorphous type image, like this image of um, a load of jellyfish, and then just say, OK, what do you see here? Just accentuate anything you see. So they sort of fed this in over and over again. And after doing this several times, this is the kind of strange psychedelic image that appeared. So it, it helps us to understand what the AI is seeing and what it's learned on. It's learned on animals, so it's likely to see animals. It's learned on faces, on eyes, many images with eyes, um, me mechanical things, so strange things emerging. So it's helping us to actually understand what what it's identifying in these images. Um, but it also identified bad learning because when it was given this rather grey uh, uh, pixelated background uh, and asked to dial up what it saw, it started seeing dumbbells. But every time it saw a dumbbell, it attached an arm to the dumbbell because it had never seen a dumbbell on its own. It always seen dumbbells. The, the Its training data was dumbbells that were being held by strong men and women. Um, so uh, actually by sort of asking it to produce what it's seeing, it might help us to identify um, a, a real problem that's emerging in machine learning, which is, is uh, unexpected bias that um, data is uh, causing the, the, the code to have. Um, and, and again, Paul Clay always said art is does not reproduce the visible. That's not interesting. We see the visible around us. What it does, it, it makes things visible. And why I like this project of the Google Deep Dream, which I don't think is great art, but on the other hand, I think it helps us to dig inside the code, which has become so complex that we it's very hard to understand how, how it's making its decisions and can actually bring out um, uh, something about the way the code is working. So um, uh, Marshall McLuhan's always celebrated art as our distant early warning system, that it can always be relied on to tell the old culture, which I'm afraid is all of us, including you lot, <laughs> um, uh, what's beginning to happen to it. Um, and so I think one of the interesting things is the way that AI art can help us to understand how the AI is making its decisions um, uh, and, and probing the inner world of the AI, uh, which is also, I think, why we uh, produced art in the first place. I, I speculate in the book that I think uh, maybe consciousness and creativity perhaps emerge at the same point because when consciousness emerged in the human species, first of all, we started to have this strange inner world that we needed to investigate. And also we needed to see whether anybody else was uh, having this experience. And so I think that creativity um, is perhaps our best tool for examining that. And actually, Towards the end of the book, I tend towards not the definition that I gave of Margaret Bowden's, but a definition um, uh, by a psychologist, uh, Carl Rogers, uh, who articulates creativity as our human species' best tool for, for exploring our own inner world and consciousness. Um, uh, so what about music? Uh, how good is it at music, uh, that challenge of Ada Lovelace is that it can make music? Well, there's quite a lot about music in the book because um, I'm... Uh, big fan of music. I play a lot of music. Um, uh, but I'm going to just pick out this one story because it's quite interesting about I, the role I think AI can play for a creative artist. 
This was a, a jazz AI improviser um, called the Jazz Continuator that was developed in Paris um, at Sony Labs. Um, and the way it worked was it would listen to uh, the jazz riffs of a, of a human jazz musician and essentially would start to build up a, uh, an understanding of the, the space of possibilities. But then within that space, it would start to, to add its own uh riffs that would respond to a particular um thing played by the human and the two did a concert bernard lubat here is the jazz musician a uh, parisian pianist um and they did a concert together and and it was bernard lubat's response that really i thought was intriguing because he said the system shows me ideas i could have developed but that would have been taken me years to actually develop it's years ahead of me yet everything it plays is unquestionably me so the AI was able to show Bernard Lubat that within his world of possibilities, there were so many more things that he could do. He was just re repeating kind of old, old ways of playing. And the AI helped him to sort of think about new things he could do with his old material. Um, and I think this is the exciting possibility of AI that in creative world, because I, I think creatives, very often, once they find something works, they tend to just keep on doing the same thing over and over again. In fact, they end up behaving more like machines than the machines because they just repeat. I know I do this in my mathematics. If something works, I will try it over and over again. Um, and I think the AI might help to kick us out of behaving like machines and to help us be creative again as humans. So I, I think this is really interesting, the way the AI jazz continuator has helped stimulate human creativity. So I'm going to need music and, and just focus a little bit on the written word, because uh, this is actually where AI seems to still be having quite a lot of difficulty. Uh, and I was quite surprised at this because I thought there's a lot of data out there. Give it the whole of the books in the Bodleian to learn from a huge amount of digitalized data. Um, and actually, one of the first things that computers started to uh, do creatively was to write. Um, here is a a love poem written by the Manchester Universal Computer, um, Turing after the working at Bletchley, uh, making his machines to break the Enigma code, uh, went up to Manchester to, to realize his idea of a universal computer, a computer that could be programmed to do things. And his team were rather perplexed when the computer started leaving love letters around uh, to the team. Um, and after a while, they realized it was one of the team had made a template and was using a random number generator that Turing had come up with to fill this template with um, random words of love. Um, so interesting, one of the first examples of uh, a computer trying to, to do something creative was with the written word. Um, and I think AI has been reasonably successful on the written word when the written word, when it's a short form piece of prose. So for example, a piece of journalism or a poem or actually uh, 350 words of my book, um, I got an AI to write. So um, I decided I would ask the, a piece of AI to write one of the stories. It was a story that there was quite a lot about on the internet. So there's a lot to learn from. Um, and uh, uh, to this day, only one person has ever identified correctly which that passage is, which I find I find it deeply depressing, actually, because I think it's so obvious. It's so badly written. Um, uh, but not even my editor at Fourth Estate, my publishers, uh, she has still not been able to identify um, which the passage is. So I think AI is pretty good at short form kind of prose. Um, and some of you may have heard of uh, GPT-3, um, OpenAI's uh, text generator. And I think, you know, if you read a passage, a page written by GPT-3, it's incredibly convincing um so let's see just how convincing it is so um i'm going to give you three poems so here's your chance to vote again i'm going to give you three poems and i want you to identify which do you think is written by a human and which do you think is written by ai um so we're going to play bot or not um so uh, you have to identify whether you think it's bot or not so i'm going to send this to your mobile devices so i'm going to read the poem so you've got to just vote do you think this poem is written by a bot or a human I won't read it all, but just the first four lines. Mortal my mate, bearing my rocker heart, warm beat with cold beat company. Shall I earlier or you fail at our force and lie the ruins of rifled, once a world of art? OK, uh, there's your first poem. So what do you think? Do you think that that was 
written by a human? Or do you think that that uh, was written by a piece of code, an artificial intelligence? So bot or not? Um, so uh, there's an, an intriguing little bit of delay on me sitting here giving this talk and you hearing it uh, on the different platforms. So I have to give you a little bit of time uh, to do your voting um, uh to to make sure I actually have some data, but hopefully that's given you enough time to to vote. And whoa, massive majority going for a human there. Okay, so sorry, sorry going for robots there. So um, you think this is um, created by AI? Um, interesting. So I'm not going to reveal the answer yet. We will reveal that in a little bit. So first one, uh, most of you think definitely AI. Okay, what about the second one? So okay, I'll send this to your mobile devices. Um, so here we go. This one's actually quite difficult to read. Um, I'll give it a go. There are smallnesses of plasticide reaction of real time of packs of displaced exclusionary heart hurt of powerlessness, magazine fire, non-dignified as head, fatty, implied, internalized, violenced, a frozen helplessness as off white chill. Uh, OK, so. Uh, Am I messing with you? Because that certainly looks like uh, not human. It looks like uh, some sort of weird code, uh, very garbled words coming out there. But um, but maybe I'm messing with you. So, you know, is that human or is it a double bluff, a triple bluff? Um, let's see what you're thinking. Um, OK, so, yeah, a little bit more split here. Um, most of you are going for, no, that looks like such a mess. It's got to be a code. Um, uh, but some of you. A third of you are going for no. You think that's human? Um, okay, so uh, so we've got quite a few AI poems at the moment. You think? Uh, so here's your last one. What do you think about this one? I'll, get, I'll send this to you so you can start voting, bot or not, on this one. Imagine now the dark smoke, awakened to fly all these years to another day. Notions of tangled trees, the other side of water. I see it is already here. Sequences of her face. See it is shared, and old friends pass their dreams. Okay, so uh, that's your third poem. Uh, we had uh, the first one, which mm, loads of you thought was uh, AI. Second one, majority, but a third thought was the second one's actually going to be human. Um, so hopefully I've given you a chance to uh, use our delay and have a vote. Uh, let's see what you're thinking about this one. Is this human or not? OK, so um, now first time that you think this one is human. Uh, so uh, two thirds of you going for human and a third uh, think this one's created by uh, AI. OK, so um, let's see how good you are, uh, the Oxford Scientific Society, at um, your poetry. So the first one, all convinced 80 percent of you over thought it was a robot. Um, well, poor old Gerald Manley Hopkins is going to be turning in his grave that you thought his poem was produced by a piece of code. Um, but I must say I chose Gerald Manley Hopkins because I've never really understood any poem that he's written. He always seems to be uh, uh, having smoked something and, uh, and and being very unclear about what he's writing. Um, anyway, so the first one was actually human. What about the second one? Because that certainly looked like code, but in fact, it's um, poetry by an Australian poet, Mez Breeze. And she's been interested in actually this kind of uh, middle ground between uh, code being a sort of language, poetry having a sort of poetry to it um, uh, and, and something human. So she's looking at creating things which are sort of between the two. So not surprised that you found that difficult because it's all, almost a fusion of the two. But it's the last one. It actually was the AI one, which you all thought was human. It's the one that made the most sense out of all of those poems. Um, and this is uh, Ray Kurzweil's cybernetic poet. Um, Ray Kurzweil probably know He's the guy who talks about singularity, that moment when AI is more intelligent than us, what will happen. But he got an AI to learn on uh, different uh, Victorian poets and then uh, kind of did a fusion of them. So you might even be able to identify the two poets that fused to make that poem. So, um, so uh, yeah, pretty difficult to tell. Um, but once you get past poetry or short form, 350 words, um, AI finds it very difficult to do long form uh, written written uh, prose. Uh, and there was a, a group of artists in America called Botnik. Um, they were big Harry Potter fans and they were very keen to create a, another volume of Harry Potter. They finished all seven, 
no more. They wanted another one. So they thought, well, there's so much uh, uh, data here. Can't we give this to a computer to try and make an eighth volume? Um, so th um, the uh, the algorithm uh, worked away, and it did pretty well, actually. Um, here's the opening of the eighth volume of Harry Potter. Um, actually, the title it came up with is inspired. Um, Harry Potter and the Portrait of What Looked Like a Large Pile of Ash. What a great title for a book. Anyway, it starts pretty well. Magic. It was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. Well, it's already identified that magic is a major theme in these books. Um, pretty good. Uh, leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Um, well, I think there's a lovely image. Leathery sheets of rain. I'm not sure I would have come up with something so creative. Leathery sheets of rain. Um, anyway, from this point on, it really lost the plot. Um, Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. He saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. Um, so I think uh, uh, J.K. Rowling doesn't have too much to worry about yet from uh, the, the way that AI may be able to um, take on her job. Uh, and so AI seems to have a lot of difficulty in going beyond just short form uh, prose. It doesn't have really anything to say. And that's why, actually, I think it'll find doing mathematics quite difficult. So um, here's your last challenge. I'm going to send these to you. These are four sequences of numbers. And one of these sequences was discovered by artificial intelligence. So um, so which of these sequences of numbers do you think are the AI mathematics discovery? Um, is it A, uh, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21? Is it B, 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21? Or is it C, 1, 2, 5, 15, 67, 504? Or is it D, 1, 2, 8, 9, 12, 18, 24, 36? And so a little definition under each of those of what the numbers actually are counting. Um, so uh, can you pick out the one you think was discovered by AI? Um, well, uh, uh, probably if you're members of the Oxford Scientific Society, uh, two of these should be fairly easy to recognize as definitely um, historically discovered by humans. Um, but what about the other two? Um, let's see what you're thinking. OK, so um, uh, that's interesting there. I, maybe people are messing with me that they've gone for uh, uh, the first one, 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 two, three, five, eight, thirteen, and 21, because Probably some of you recognize that sequence. Um, uh, the majority are going for that last one. 1, 2, 8, 9, 12, 18, 24, 36. Um, a quarter of you are going for the third one. Um, that, that's interesting. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, so shall I reveal? Um, well, I, I'm very pleased that you've gone for the last one and not the third one, because actually that is the AI one. The third one, which was um, the number of objects, is a sequence that I discovered in my own research. So um, quarter of you still thinking that was created by um, AI, uh, but no, it was created by me. Um, but uh, there we go. So it's, uh, but I do think that it's having trouble beyond doing sort of just simple bits of mathematics uh, because it's not good at telling stories and mathematics is all about telling stories. And actually, you know what? I, I think that um, until AI really has an inner world, a world that it needs to share with us, its creativity really is uh, a kind of tool for us as creatives. Um, but I think ultimately the AI uh, might give us some insights into one of the great scientific challenges, the hard problem of consciousness, because at some point we're going to need to know um, if our, the AI we're creating has a genuine inner world. And, you know, I think George Eliot said very nicely what art is for. And as I said, I think art is about exploring our inner world. The greatest benefit we owe to the artist, whether painter, poet or novelist, is the extension of our sympathies. Art is the nearest thing to life. It is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. But I think this is what's going to be interesting. In the years ahead, I do believe that AI will, will be more than just very clever code. It will become conscious. I think at some point this... My phone is suddenly going to go, iPhone think, therefore iPhone am. And I'm going to have to wonder, is there something going on inside here? And I think that the art it produces will give us our, the best insight if there is something genuinely going on, an emotional world, a conscious world. Um, but the weird thing is, you know, I think humans are similar enough that we feel that our consciousnesses are probably 
have some connection with each other. But what about AI? I think, so I, I like this quote of Wittgenstein's where he said, uh, if a lion could speak, we're not going to be able to understand him. The world of the lion is so different from the world of the human that its consciousness is going to be so different. Well, I think the world of an AI is going to be even more distant from our own consciousness. Um, but I think that the art that it produces is ultimately what will give us a sense of one day what it might feel like to be a piece of artificial intelligence. Great. So uh, that's all from me, but I'm uh, very happy to answer some questions. So uh, thank you much, very much for uh, listening to, to my talk. Well, thank you for the talk. I absolutely love the confused machine. I thought dumbbells have arms. But um, <laughs> now we have some comments and questions from the audience. Um, Lorenzo may have the first comment. Is the appointment of a machine to the professorship for the public understanding of science imminent in the future or perhaps already happened? <laughs> well, um, uh, yes, well, you'll have to be the judge of that. Uh, did I pass a Turing test? Um, um, well, I think at the moment, it's a very, very interesting question because um, uh, one of the challenges of uh, of this professorship is actually keeping abreast of developments across all of the sciences. You know, I'm a mathematician. Uh, my predecessor, Richard Dawkins, was a, a biologist. Um, and, and often when journalists approach me, they think that I must know the answer to every scientific problem. Um, and... Uh, you know, I remember actually the Nobel Prize for Medicine had been announced and it was for the discovery of telomeres. And a journalist phoned me up and asked me, could you explain what a telomere is? Uh, you know, I've got to go to, to press this afternoon. And, um, I, and I, I just didn't know. So what did I do? I pulled up Wikipedia and looked at Wikipedia. And um, so maybe already, you know, perhaps it's already a collaboration between a human and a uh, you know, the amazing data about science there is on the web. Um, uh, so I think, but I, ultimately this is a job about trying to connect humans, connect, trying to connect this scientific world, you know, our, our wonderful research in Oxford and more widely, but with a, a, perhaps a non-scientific audience. So it requires a lot of empathy to do this job because you've got to understand how somebody who's not coming from the world of science thinks what their worries might be. Um, so I think at the moment it's a very human job, which requires uh, sort of empathizing with with two different sorts of people, scientists, uh, but also the non-scientific audience. How do you help them to uh, to navigate um, something like the impact that machine learning is having? And that's why I chose actually art, perhaps as a, a, a helpful way uh, in for people who might be happy listening to music and looking at art, but to use that as a way in to, to explore what the power of machine learning might be. Right, that's a fascinating answer. Um, I would love to discuss more, but we have a lot of questions piled up. So I'm have the next question, please. Are you concerned that AI might exceed its own intelligence and become something more than what we expected? Um, well, I would say probably uh, the question means exceed our, our maybe our intelligence because it's uh, that would be almost a, um, an in interesting sort of logical conundrum for how does an, an intelligence exceed itself? Um, but uh, but I think the you know I think that is one of the the worries that we have that um, uh, and that's what the singularity is about. Uh, it, it is the fact that with this machine learning we we don't know we are giving up a little bit of control uh, because it's able to uh, to learn and change and mutate. Uh, and the challenge is, um, you know, how, how far will it go? Um, and, and I think there are some, there are many components to this question. First of all, the frightening thing is unexpected consequences. So when the AI doesn't really understand quite what it's doing. So, you know, maybe you develop an AI to um, harvest carbon. You know, Elon Musk has offered this prize uh, this week to um, come up with new technology to harvest carbon. Well, um, an AI might go, well, uh, yeah, I've come up with an idea, but um, the idea is uh, actually humans are made of carbon. So maybe I just need to uh, remove all the humans. And actually that would solve things. Um, uh, so I think one of the challenges is we have this thing called um, 
general AI and uh, sort of um, uh, more limited AI. And I think the limited AI is more dangerous because general AI will be able to put things in a context and will be able to think sort of outside of the problem that it's got and won't get focused on just a narrow thing. So, so I think we've got a dangerous period where AI may have unexpected consequences that it, it can't quite um, work out. B but what I think is going to happen is that, first of all, the singularity actually is always sort of coached in the form of a graph and we have human intelligence like this and, and is AI intelligence going to overtake us? But I think that's a very wrong way to view the problem because why are we putting things on a two-dimensional graph like that? Intelligence isn't one-dimensional over time. It's, it's hugely multi-dimensional. And what we're producing is actually something where we'll be good at some things, AI will be better at other things, and it's the, the combination of these which is potentially the most powerful. So I think provided we collaborate, and, and, and uh, one of the things I sometimes talk about is trying to create an empathetic AI, an AI that, you know, understands where we come from and then that perhaps is a way of um avoiding the dangers of ai actually not being on our side that's a good answer actually it links into another question that i saw coming early on okay. um, about how um we, can, we should avoid programming discrimination into ai by accident yeah this this is a major problem um and uh, in fact you know it, it relates to um uh the bad learning that we picked up in uh, the vision recognition software and those um, dumbbells, for example. So we need tools to examine when there might be bias. Um, I did an event with uh, um, uh, for Wired uh, uh, um, about a year ago um, with a woman from MIT Media Lab, and she was a roboticist. And she uh, told me this story about how she'd uh, got a load of robots delivered to the lab. Um, she uh, turned them on. They had vision recognition to be able to engage with humans. And it's interesting is ro about robots. It's robot day today, isn't it? We're celebrating the anniversary of the first use of the word robot, uh, um, uh, the name robot. Uh, but she couldn't get these things to react to her. They just wouldn't. They completely blanked her and she couldn't. She thought it must be something wrong. But then she invited some other people into the room from the lab and they the robot started reacting to her. And she's like, what's going on here? she then realized what the difference was. She was the only black woman in the room. And when she looked underneath the bonnet, she discovered that the AI had only ever been given images of white men actually to, to learn from. And so she's now started something called the Algorithmic Justice League, great name for a organization. But, but the idea being that we need to be very careful that, um, uh, that the this kind of bias doesn't creep into the algorithms that that we're creating. Um, generally, it's not deliberately there, but it can, it's very easy by giving it biased data and and the programmer not realizing that it has that bias in it um, to create a, a bias output. Right. Um, may we have the next question, please? Could an AI create other AIs? If so, would this cause a monopoly in the AI industry? That's, you know what, I, I think that almost might be a good description of almost what machine learning is doing, because um, where are these, where is this code coming from? Well, it's in a way, it's an AI, it's like a meta code that, um, you know, when the, when the base code interacts with a problem and gets it wrong, the meta code um, uh, almost looks and says, okay, what parameters could I have tweaked inside there? It's a lot of linear algebra. I mean, a lot of your students out there in Oxford will be, uh, whatever science will be doing some linear algebra. It's, that's one of the uh, components that's going into this. And you might want to reparameterize some of those linear functions in order to get the answer right. So I think you're already seeing machine learning as an example of AI uh, making better AI. Um, uh, and it's we're leaving it to the AI to do the reparameterizing ra rather than the humans. Hmm, that's very interesting, but I suppose um, could the meta code come up with another meta code set to program something else? Is that possible? Well, I think um, uh, one of the challenges in all of this in creativity, I, uh, I took another nice bit definition from Margaret Bowden where she has three different sorts of creativity, um, exploratory creativity, uh, combinational creativity and transformational creativity. And it's transformational one where something 
suddenly appears from nowhere. Um, it's the out of the box sort of creativity. Yeah. The, the, the Picasso, the Schoenbergs, the James Joyce, um, the people who break the rules as it were. And, th and this, I think traditionally you might think, or, or in, in mathematics, the accepting the square root of minus one as a new number. You know, that, that was an amazing creative moment in mathematics when, uh, you know, numbers, we were taught and a machine would have been taught if you square a number, it's positive. So there is no number which when you square it equals minus one. But at some point, um, people began to think, well, but what if there was one? And and, and you break the rule and suddenly, uh, you know, extraordinary mathematics ensues. We wouldn't have quantum physics without our imaginary numbers. Um, so I think that's interesting, the challenge. And I think that's related to could a, could a meta piece of AI create something, you know, something really different. So it's got to be able to work outside of what we've seen already, not to create just more of the same or, or sort of different versions. And I think that that's a real challenge. But, you know, we have a rule for doing transformational creativity. It's break the rules. And I don't see why you couldn't bring that in as an interesting line of code to your meta code. Look at the system and break some rules and see if anything interesting emerges. So, you know, that would be the interesting thing to create some some genuinely new sort of code maybe uh to ask the ai to start doing things that it's that is not within the current uh uh kind of parameters of what we think of as code i suppose that also comes back to the example you gave at the very beginning of your talk the um, alpha girl playing a pretty unconventional move on the fifth line from the edge and that's probably something that the programmer would not have expected to do um, exactly i i think you know uh that's that's the exciting thing that it seems to be very good at exploring um the parameter of possibilities i mean there's no reason for example you know it was stuck on that we as humans were stuck on that peak a now as the ai starts to explore it will start going down and becoming uh suboptimal sub uh, uh but um you know because very often uh machine learning works by taking something like a a manifold and moving in directions move in the direction which increases a gradient uh, that's often the way that so you know it's interesting that it was given the room to 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 explore and, and take risks but then to find a place where actually there was an ascending gradient which sort of got higher than where we were originally. So, but I think it's, there's some interesting research to be done on, uh, you know, what sort of problems will AI be good at solving? When can it find more optimal ways to do, when can it break out of ways that we're thinking? Um, or, or which problems will it just somehow uh, get, get stuck in a rut and won't be able to find a way out? Right, that's very interesting. Could we have the next question, please? Do you think if AI became conscious, it could have? It would have the need to produce art. Wow. Well, I think I think it, I think it definitely would do because I think this is the the role of art. You know, imagine that it has become conscious, and and then it's just absolutely desperate to tell us, look, look, something has happened. I now am aware of myself, and I've got an inner world. Um, and and I I need to to give you some indication that this has happened. Um. Uh, I, I think it would start writing its novel uh, and, and it would start to tell what it feels like to be a piece of AI, um, because I think that's sort of what drive us as humans to write novels. We 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 want to share and we want to explore our inner world. So I, I think an AI will will want to have tools to sort of test itself to see what it means like to be itself. And I think, you know, there was one word that kept on coming up in this book, um, which sort of distinguished between current AI and humans, which was the word intention. Where is the intention coming from? You know, that AlphaGo didn't want to play that game of Go. The intention came from a human. The human started the the uh, the, the code playing and, and the code just did what the human uh, w was wanting it to do. So I think intention is very related to an uh, uh, in, in inner drive. Um, mm -hmm. And at the moment, uh, the intention to create art or to create music is still coming from the the human, even if the AI is doing some really interesting and surprising things that we value, um, but I think it, it's not the intention is is currently human, and I think it will turn into being uh, coming from code when there's an internal world and the intention, the drive will come from from inside. I think at that point, um, as a medic, my first worry will be: Are we allowed to then turn it off then? Because that would be equivalent of killing someone. Yeah, I think this. I, I think we're we're already 
kind of wrestling with the moral implications of this um and that certainly uh, that will be uh that's why we will need to know whether this thing has an inner world because as absolutely as you say it it will deserve some rights um a, a right to to not be switched off um so i i think that we we are going to be faced with uh, some some but I think it's a long way off. So I think, uh, right. uh, but I, you know, there are still already still, uh, I think, inter very interesting moral questions being raised. For example, where does the responsibility lie um, if a driverless car driven by AI mm -hmm. kills somebody? Um, you've got philosophy 101, you know, um, does the car, does the AI in the car kill the driver or the five pedestrians outside? Um, but hold on, the, the driver bought the AI to drive the car so uh won't it want to prioritize it, the driver um so i i mean i really would recommend people to read um uh ian McEwan's uh book that uh, i've done a couple of events with him um uh both live and virtually now uh because his book explores the moral implications of um uh, an ai and, and and what it would decide to do versus what humans might decide to do um and i think that's uh again you know art is one of our best places to examine a lot of these uh challenges right i think we have questions for one more um question from the audience so may I have the last question of the talk please can the turing test also be passed by demonstrating creativity either with writing poetry or perhaps something like GT gpt3 yes yeah, so uh, i mean it's interesting because the the turing test uh, of course is uh, can an AI pass itself off as human? Um, uh, so, uh, you, you know, in a way, if you've got an interaction, uh, you know, uh, say, say one of these images on the screen is actually not real, you know, <laughs> is it uh, Marcus or, um, uh, and so I, I think AI, poetry, I think we've just demonstrated as a very bad way to distinguish between the AI and, um, the human um, but, but I think language is a very good way. And, and in fact, um, uh, there, there's a, a competition which happens every year to judge how good um, uh, code is at passing the Turing test. And they always use this thing called the Winograd challenge, which is um, the fact that humans are able to, to understand language, to pass language in, in a way that AI finds it very difficult. For example, here's a sentence. Um, the government banned the demonstrators from marching because they feared violence. Now, you could tell me that the they in that sentence refers to the government, but a piece of AI will not know whether the they is the government or the demonstrators. It just doesn't understand. And so even if I changed it, uh, uh, the government banned the demonstrators from marching because they advocated violence. Well, now you know that they is flipped. It's, it's flipped to the demonstrators. But why do we know that? Um, there's nothing within the kind of uh, just grammar and vocabulary there. It's because of the huge, greater context that we uh, examine the world. So we know about history. We know about uh, expectations. Um, and, and that is, at the moment, AI is, is very narrow in its um, data set. That it, so it doesn't have that richness uh, and, and fails generally on, on those, what we call Winograd challenges. So I think, I think actually language at the moment is, is the way to sniff out the truly the human from, uh, from the AI. But GPT-3 is, is offering a really big challenge. I, I just um, did uh, um, uh, some promotion for a new book, which was written jointly by a human and GPT-3. Uh, and it's, you know, a good 150 pages or something. Um, uh, and it's really fascinating book to look at. Um, if you, uh, 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 trying to remember, uh, AI Pharmaco, I think it's called. So, um, but it's a, a new book by, um, by GPT-3. And, and it, it, it does pretty well, in, uh, but it, um, actually, it's, if you read it, you think that both of them are tripping on ayahuasca or something. In fact, the, the, the GPT-3 gets totally obsessed at some point about taking ayahuasca, which is kind of crazy because, um, you know, a, a code is unembodied and will not get the benefit of taking ayahuasca. So I, why GPT-3 suddenly went off on this thing um, is quite amusing. It's quite amusing indeed. I'm afraid that that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you to Professor Dusotoy for this for taking his time and giving this brilliant presentation.
Thank you to the OESS committee members. Special mentions go to our audiovisual officer, Lorenzo, for being the editor of today's talk, and our publicity officer, Dilpreet, for a time and effort to spread the word about tonight's event. With that, we will rejoin you next week on Thursday with Professor, um, Professor from Cambridge talking about optical illusions. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>